Uh, right. Ready to go? Yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ro, give us an overview. How has this um, very strange situation impacted your life? So, I'd have to tell people a little bit about, about me, just in case people don't know. If you like. I think most people will remember you, but for those who are new to the church, then give us, give us an introduction. Well, my name's Ro Willoughby, and I was married to Robert Willoughby, and Robert was ordained in uh, 2014 and as a priest and was on the staff team at St Michael's for four years. Um, the last year of that, he had a blood cancer, and um, we went up and down to UCLH from Highgate. And then um, he took a retirement and we moved up to Sheffield to be near our family, which is where I'm now speaking from. In fact, I'm sitting in the cot of my almost three-year-old grandson because that's where I'm living at the moment. You moved to Sheffield and Robert died a short time later. And then mm. here we are now, months afterwards, with an extraordinary pandemic and viral outbreak unfolding that has probably touched pretty much everybody's life um, in one way or another. Mm. How has it affected you? Well, you're quite right. Robert did die just three months after we moved up to Sheffield. Uh, the first three months that we were here were just glorious. The sun shone every day. We caught up with um, our, our friends in the north and we'd already been able to say goodbye to our friends in the southeast. Um, and so there was a real sense of closure before we moved. Of course, it was huge disappointment that um, the life that my children and I had hoped we were going to have together with Robert, that's just not going to happen. And so we miss him badly. And of course, it's Father's Day coming up. And uh, for both my son and daughter, that's a sad time because they realise that their children will not grow up knowing their granddad. And they won't, um, only one of them will have any memory of him at all. So I've been establishing a life of my own in Sheffield and and it has been it's been great it's a wonderful city to live in as as you will know Simon it is a wonderful part of the world we live on the edge of the Peak District and I'm part of St Chad's Wood Seats which has been a, a church that have been very welcoming to me there's lots of opportunities to be involved in in preaching and doing stuff with children and families and just getting to know people so um my daughter, who lives just a mile away from me, she had her daughter, her second child, just three weeks before lockdown. So in those three weeks, I was busy spending quite a lot of time with, with, um, with my daughter and with Alice Hope, who is the most beautiful little girl, and with her almost three-year-old grandson, uh, her almost three-year-old son, Ben. And when lockdown came, I thought, well, I've been part of their household so probably we can be um, one household, but in two locations. And then my son, who lives the other side of Sheffield, he rang me up the evening that Boris made the announcement and told us that we had to um, stay at home. And, and he said, you can't do that. You're going to have to go and live with them or else stay on your own. I don't think it's altogether good for me to be completely on my own and isolated. And I'm sure there may be some people listening now who... Um, for whom it, it's been a real struggle. And I know a, a, quite a lot of grandparents who have felt desperate because they've just missed out on, their, on seeing the development of their children and they've missed out on, on their grandchildren. So I moved in and I moved in and I live in the attic at the top of their house. And actually that has been great. I mean, my daughter and son-in-law, we get on well together. Um, but it means that I have been really privileged to be part of the very early weeks of my granddaughter's life. And I've noticed things about her that I never noticed with my own children because I was too busy just sort of surviving. Um, I've also spent a lot of time with my grandson. And I think I've probably helped my, um, my son and, and my, my daughter and my son-in-law. Uh, it does mean, of course, though, that I haven't seen very much of my son who lives the other side of the, the city and his wife, Beth, um, who is now seven and a half months pregnant. 
And so they were very much self-isolating. Um, they've got two other children. So I didn't see much of them, the occasional doorstep conversation. And I did go and have a meal with them at the bottom of the garden um, the week before last. So it's been, it's been a strange time. Um, it's, um, I've had lots of phone conversations with people uh, who talk, we talked honestly about all sorts of things that I think we haven't talked about before. I've talked to quite a number of people about um, God and where is he in all this. And it was interesting that about the Sunday before last, I was actually preaching, it was Trinity Sunday, I was preaching on the last uh, verses of Matthew's Gospel where Jesus says to his disciples, he sends them out in the world to tell the good news of, um, of Jesus. And then he says, and I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. And so basically, I, the vicar wanted me to preach on God being with us. And uh, just before I was recording the preaching, because our, our preaching is, is recorded, but the rest of the service is live on Facebook. Um, just before I recorded that, I... Um, I got up one morning and I thought, I don't want to get dressed. So I went down, I got a piece of toast, a cup of tea, came up to, to the attic. And um, it was quite unlikely, really. And I thought, I just don't want to get dressed. I don't want to get up. So I lay down and I pulled the duvet over my head. And I was miserable. And part of this, of course, was that I was missing Robert as well. And though, of course, if he had been alive, I probably wouldn't have been living in the attic on my own because I don't think there would have been enough room for both of us. So um, eventually I got up and I drove out into the Peak District and I looked out over the beautiful scenery and I breathed in the fresh air. Oh, but I was still feeling fairly miserable. And then in the space of just five minutes, I got two messages from people in my church. One woman just texted me to see how I was. And then somebody else sent me a picture of Jesus getting hold of the hand of Peter as he was walking on the water and pulling him up to safety. And in five minutes, I had these two contacts with people from church that I was very grateful for. But both of them, in different ways, were assuring me that God was with me. Because I'd, as I'd lain under the duvet, I'd have thought, how can I possibly preach on God being with me? Because he didn't feel near me. But as I sat there, out in the Peak District, having received these two messages, I thought, well, I don't know if I feel any closer to God. But by faith, I believe that he is there, because Jesus, 2,000 years ago, promised that he would never leave us. He would never forsake us right to the very end of the age. So I think one of the things I've really learned um, since Robert died, even but particularly during lockdown is this sense that God has promised to never leave us he will always be with us we may not feel anything but by faith that we believe he is and then every now and again there are indications that that, that he's there so lockdown's been actually it's been it's been okay I mean it's been weird I haven't known when one day is the next you know I mean I don't make any decisions my daughter decides what we eat even does my washing. I do some cleaning. I do a lot of emptying of the dishwasher. I do a lot of playing with the grandchildren. And occasionally I go back to my house and spend a night there to water the plants and look at the post and that sort of thing. But um, so in one sense, well, it has been very strange. It's been full of some anxieties. But it's, for me personally, it's given me a chance to reflect, to make some observations about my life. I had to talk a lot to God, to miss Robert, but to realise that God is with me because Jesus promised he would be. So that's lockdown for me. <laughs> what, what do you think prompted the crawling and back under the duvet episode? Well, I think there was the, well, I think it was the beginning stage of lockdown when there were so many confused messages. And I have been particularly troubled about what it means for children who are uh, deprived. My son-in-law teaches maths in uh, a secondary school where there are many, many children 
who um, have special needs and come from underprivileged homes. And quite frankly for them, educationally and socially and in terms of their mental health, it has been extraordinarily painful and um, maybe long-term damaging. My son is a social worker and he would say exactly the same because he's a children's or family social worker, so he works with people who have been very, found the whole thing very difficult. It seems to me that the messages that have been coming out, particularly in relation to children, to schools, uh, school dinners in the summer, uh, they have been very confusing. And I think I, I have, that has really, really troubled me. And I feel very powerless to do anything about it. And I think it was probably that issue more than anything. Now, I think also I had been talking to a few grandparents who've been very troubled as well. But it just made me think, this is, this is madness. And how long is it going to go on for? And what's the long-term effect? And I think it was also the sense of, and how long am I going to be in this attic? I mean, it's fine. I haven't got a window, but I've got a very large skylight. And I see the clouds, the occasional bird. I haven't seen any um, plane trails for months, but I now see some of those. Um, so, and I, I do spend a lot of time on my own, but that's fine because I've got used to my own company. But I think it was this sense of how is this going to go on for? But also, I think in, in the way God communicates with us, I think he was wanting to remind me that he is with me. And that particular experience out in the peaks was, um, I didn't feel any different, but I had been reminded of God's promise. So... I, I don't think I've been under, under the duvet like that at any other time. Yes. Obviously, I mean, I've, I've started to thought, goodness, you know, what's all this about? I mean, you mentioned, the, you mentioned the question of where, I think you said, where is God in all this? Is that something that people have asked you or is that something that you've been asking as well? Well, I think, I think the church and Christians have had a bit of a wake-up call because we do church differently. Um, I've had far more, I've had a few Zoom calls, but I've done far more on the phone. I, on the whole, I don't feel the need to see people when I'm talking to them, I can imagine them. Um, and I think it's as though we're plants that have been pulled up and the roots are being shaken. And well, what's gonna happen now? Are the roots going to be replanted in a different place? Um, and I think there is lots of uncertainty. So uh, some people have said to me that they think this is, um, this is punishment for the way that we have handled the environment. And I think that there is, there is certainly, there is that sense in terms of the way that we live, we live our lives. And I hope that, um, that there will be serious impacts on how we drew, view the environment as a result. But I think, it's, I think it's just the uncertainty and where is God in all this is one of the questions that, um, that people are asking along, along with a whole load of other questions. And I think there's something very definite that we as Christians can say that, that God has not left us and that God will be involved in the restoration. And it may be that lots more people are going to turn to, to Christ because particularly also that there's the question of Am I going to die? I can't control my death day. Am I going to catch the virus? And uh, I, I was only yes last week was um, having uh, a tea with, with a friend of mine whose husband died at the beginning of April after four weeks on a ventilator. And um, that was very, um, for me, that has been one of the, 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 facts of, of the whole lockdown that have just run along with me because I, I, I felt for her during, during the time he was on the ventilator and she couldn't see him. She herself had had the COVID virus at the same time as him. And, and then people couldn't go to her house to comfort her and her family all live a long way away. And it was uh, immensely painful. So I think it's, it's a range of things actually but I do think people are asking where is God in this who is God how does God make himself known and ultimately 
it is it is in Christ who died, but Christ who also came alive again. And um, the resurrection of Christ is something that means so much more to me ever since uh, Robert died. I'd never thought as much about what Jesus' resurrection body was like until Robert died, because I wanted to know what his body is like and what my body would be like when I, when I die. And in, in that uncertainty that you talk about for the church, the, the sort of uprooting that's happened, do you also see positive opportunity? Yes, I do. I do. I mean, I think that lots of people in my own church are, um, are connecting with our, our services online. I think that lots of people have engaged with their neighbours and in their community. And in my church, there's, there's quite a lot of involvement in, in various projects that are supporting the homeless. Um, there is a, a Beeson project which is, collects furniture for people who, who are moving into accommodation and have no furniture. They've been rehoused or they are asylum seekers who've been given a home. Um, people involved in food banks. So there's quite a lot of people involved in particular needs like that. And I think there'll be other opportunities for the church to serve in the community. Uh, but it is very unknown quite how, how we are all going to be changed as a result of this and how we cope with uncertainty, how we can cope with life and death. I think I'll suggest we wrap it up there because it's a good good duration is there anything else you think we should talk about well, I'd just like to, those of you who remember me and know me i'd like to send my love to you and say that um robert and i our time in in highgate in st michael's was a very rich experience robert particularly loved preaching and having conversations with people he was always made for the cafe culture so he would spend a lot of time talking to people in and around highgate and it was a very um great time but also um and when he was ill, uh, we were very conscious of the love and the care and the prayer um, for people. And then some of the practical ways that uh, I know, Simon, you, you lent him some DVDs to watch, which was, uh, which I thought was a very imaginative and very much appreciated thing that you offered. So, um, so I'd like to thank you for that, um, because if I hadn't been able to thank you for before, then now's as good a chance as any. Message received. Thanks very much, Ro. Thanks very much. Okay, bye-bye.